different instead of being live and having interaction uh, need to record this um, probably what we're going to do in the foreseeable future um, if things aren't you know, normal in the next few weeks instead of meeting at 445 on Thursdays I think what I'm going to do is push it back four hours to 1245 that way when it's lunchtime uh, you eat lunch at noon or whatever and then a little bit after lunch uh, we can just plan on meeting then uh, vacation Bible school will be coming up soon, and the work days, uh, you know, a lot of your families will be here at church at 5, 6 o'clock, and I didn't want it to conflict with that. Um, so today, just going to be a recording uh, so that you have something that you can view, and then next week, let's plan on meeting uh, Thursday for the teenagers, 6th grade and up, at 1245. And for those of you who have younger siblings that have been coming to the um, Friday um, the Friday kids Bible studies, we'll change that as well. So Thursday at 1245 for the teenagers and Friday at 1245 for those fifth grade and down. If you have any prayer requests, uh, obviously can't share it in, in this avenue, venue, uh, but if you have anything you'd like for me to personally pray about, just respond to the message uh, that led you to this video and I'll be happy to pray about that for you. Let's have a quick word of prayer, and then we're going to pick back up with Philippians chapter 2 and uh, read um, a few verses and then focus mainly on verses 5 through 11, and then um, we'll save the rest for next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these Gethsemane teenagers. Uh, though today is different and not live, I pray, Lord, this recording may be something that they can tune in and concentrate on um, whenever they have the opportunity. Uh, being recorded, uh, if they feel inclined to. I pray, Lord, they may even maybe share it with a, a friend or someone they go to school with or maybe a family member. Lord, this is one of the most beautiful passages in the New Testament about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, though I'm, I'm nowhere near able to, to say everything that it says, Lord, just help me to share a few things from these verses uh, that would get our eyes off of ourselves, that would get our eyes off of our surroundings and off of our world, and just for a few minutes reflect and think on Jesus Christ, who is higher than the highest, but as the perfect servant, he became lower than the lowest. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, you should be able to see on the screen there. What we're going to do is look at Philippians. We'll start reading in verse 1, uh, but mainly we're going to look at verses 5 through 11. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill you my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love being of one accord of one mind. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also you are to look on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So a little bit of introduction before we get into verse 5. You know, that, that's a verse that we hear a lot of times. Philippians is filled with uh, verses that we hear a lot of times, but we're not actually sure what the verses mean because usually we just hear those verses, you know, just a little snippet, but we don't get the full picture. Philippians 4.13, I can all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Well, what does that even mean? What's the verses before it and after it say? Can I really do all things in Christ? Can I jump off a building for Christ? Can I swim through the ocean for Christ? Well, what did Paul mean when he said, I can do all things? Well, it's similar here in verse 4, uh, excuse me, verse 5. He said, let this mind be in you. All right? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So the question we need to ask is, what is the mind of Christ? If I need to have the mind of Christ, well, I need to find out what kind of mind Christ had. Now, very important word, this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So does that mean I don't need to look at bad things or think about bad things? Well, I mean, you could use it for that. Does it mean that I should only think about the things that Jesus thought about? Well, that, that would be an example for to aim for, one we obviously would fall short of. 
So what does Paul mean when he said, let this mind be in you? I think what he meant when he said in verse 5, this mind, is what he just said back in verse 4. He said, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let that mind be in you. All right, so we need to have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is looking out for other people and not just ourselves. Now, how does Jesus Christ model for us that mind? As we look in the Bible and we look at Jesus, does it give us any indication of what Jesus did to put others ahead of himself? Well, yeah, actually, uh, his entire life. Everything Jesus did in his earthly ministry, I, I think, let's make sure I'm not saying anything wrong. Everything, can I say that? Everything Jesus did, it was for us. Why would he leave heaven and come to the earth? Why would he go from a throne to a manger? Why would he go from being surrounded with heavenly beings and creatures to being surrounded by sinners? Why would he go from a place where there is no sin to a world that was filled with sin? Was it to make himself better? Was it to make himself gain something or earn something? No. What he was doing is what verse 4 says. He was putting others ahead of himself. Well, who are the others? It's me and you. He was putting us ahead of himself. Now, one way that people uh, you know, can be exalted and magnified and honored is when we look at the sacrifice that they make. You know, if I leave this office and go and scrub the floor, you know, that, that's not the, the biggest sacrifice in the world, but I guess it could be seen as one. Well, what if the mayor or the governor or the president of the United States left where they were at and came to scrub the floor. You know, they would get a bigger pat on the back. Why? Because they're doing the same job as me? No, because of the position they left to do the job of me. Now, when Jesus came to this world, he was not just an ordinary human coming into this world to do the same thing that everyone else does. See, unlike all of us, Jesus was before he was. Jesus existed before he came to this world. John, John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So that means that Jesus existed before there was anything. Why? Because he is God, the Trinity. So Jesus is way up here. But yet, for us, the Bible says in verse 6, that Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But look at verse 7. The one who is infinitely high, he came infinitely low. He made himself of no reputation. You know, we like that, don't we? We like to be known. We like to be recognized. We like to have a reputation around town, around the community. Famous people like to have a worldwide, rep, worldwide reputation. But here is the one who made all things. And what did he get? No reputation. reputation. And he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He was made in the likeness of men. Paul said in Galatians chapter 4 that when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son as an angel, as an animal, as an alien. No, as a human being, made of a woman, made under the law. So Jesus Christ came to this world as a human being. Verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, going back to Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4, we need to be humble. We need to be meek. We need to be lowly. We need to put others ahead of our own desires and wishes. And Jesus Christ exemplified that perfectly. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself 
He humbled himself. What is the most humiliating thing, Gethsemane teens, that you've ever been through? What is the most, ah, sorry, what is the most humiliating thing that you've ever been through? Think about that. What is the most ridicule that you've endured, the most persecution that you've ever suffered, the worst thing that you've ever gone through for the benefit of other people? And after we've come up with an answer, and me and you, we put all of them in one basket, it would never in a million years compare to the humiliation of Jesus Christ. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And not just any kind of death, but the death of the cross. Jesus Christ humbled himself by being a servant. Jesus Christ humbled himself by being a servant who would die. But Jesus Christ humbled himself by being a servant who would die in the most humiliating way possible on the cross. Something that was reserved to torture people and make a mockery of the human body. To inflict pain, not so that people would ease out of this world carefully, but so they would die in the most excruciating pain that we could ever imagine. And let me say this, he did not go there kicking and screaming. He didn't encounter that death being pulled against his will. No, what does it say right here? Oh, sorry, boy, I messed that up big time. What does it say in verse 8? He became obedient unto death. Became obedient unto death. He said in John chapter 10, No man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take my life up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So that when Jesus Christ became a servant who lived as a human, who was a human, who lived as a servant, who died, who died one of the most humiliating ways possible, the death on the cross, he went there obediently. Why? Because he was fulfilling a mission and a purpose. Well, we're going to find out in verse 12 what one of those purposes was. Let's continue. Verse number 9. When you look at the humility of Jesus Christ, when you look at the humility of Jesus Christ and the fact that he died, verse 9 tells us the response. Wherefore, because of this, wherefore, this word that connects verse 9 back to the previous verses, wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every knee in heaven, every knee in earth, and every knee of things under the earth. That's pretty much everything that you can imagine. From the highest of the highs to the lowest of the lows, there is one who is over all of it. And that is the name of Jesus Christ. That at that name, Every knee should bow. And then verse 11. And that every tongue should confess what? That Jesus Christ was a good human. That Jesus Christ was a good teacher. That Jesus Christ was a good leader. That Jesus Christ was a good prophet. That Jesus Christ was a good revolutionary figure. That Jesus Christ was a good example. That Jesus Christ is someone who's like a magic genie and he gives you all of your wishes. No. That this Jesus, because he came from an infinitely high position and he came lower than any of us could ever imagine, he came to this world. He came to the globe. And then he went up 
went back up to heaven. And because he went back to heaven, not in defeat, someone at the end of their life who's struggling, who dies in a sad way. No, he went to heaven victoriously. He ascended back to heaven in a resurrected, powerful body. That Jesus, one day, Gethsemane teens and everybody else who's ever lived in the face of this universe, heaven, earth, and below the earth, Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to Jesus Christ, who is Lord. And that will be to the glory of God the Father. So, the question is this. When we look at this life of Christ, who left heaven who come to this world, who exemplified what a servant is, who put us ahead of himself, who died not for his sins because he was sinless, but he died for our sins. God the Father proved that he accepted the work of Christ because he raised him from the dead, and he appeared with many undeniable proofs and evidences. And we have the gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and the rest of the New Testament to verify that with literally thousands of copies around the world that have been spread so that we can hear and receive that message today. When you think about all that, if we will stand before God, or rather sense. We will stand before God one day and we will bow the knee and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Are you going to wait till after you die and be forced to do that? Or because the Holy Spirit working in your heart and giving you a heart that will follow Christ, believe in Christ, love Christ, die for Christ, live for Christ. And by the Holy Spirit, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Will you do that before you die? If you do that after you die, you will do it. It'll just be too late. But if you will do that beforehand... Well, guess what you get to spend the rest of your life doing? In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not just in my presence only, not just when I'm watching, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation, not work for your salvation, but work out what is already in your heart with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will, as to desire, and to do, that is to perform, of his good pleasure, the things that please him. If you will do this, if you will confess and bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and he is your Savior, you will get to spend the rest of your life working out what God has already worked in, so that your life can please God. If that's not your desire, then we can pray together that the Lord would give you a heart to desire those things. If that is your desire, then we can bow our head and thank the Lord Jesus Christ that He has given us a heart that instead of rejecting Him and running from Him, has ran to Him, has come to the crucified Savior, who is also resurrected, and say, Jesus, you're also my Lord. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for those who view this video. I pray, Lord, that you may use it for your glory. In spite of my failings, in spite of my weaknesses, 
in spite of all the things that I may have misspoke on, I pray, Lord, that the work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who left heaven, come to this world, died and rose again, who is coming again one day, Lord, give us hearts that before we're forced to, in this life willfully, we would bow our knee in our lives to the Lordship of Christ and confess with our lips that Jesus Christ, you're more than a man, you're more than a prophet, you're more than an example, you're more than a role model. You are in fact Lord of heaven and earth. And it's just a pleasure that we get to be your servants. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you all for viewing this, um, and I will see you live, Lord willing, next Thursday at 1245.